I'll turn to Matthew chapter 13, and this morning we're continuing our series uh, on parables. We have one more week of parables, and two weeks from today, Pastor Luke is going to be joining me up on the platform. It is back to school Sunday, and we are going to uh, highlight our students who are going back to uh, college and high school and elementary school, and uh, those kids are homeschool. We're going to be celebrating them, praying over them praying over our parents, praying over our administrators, our teachers, uh, and it's going to be a wonderful Sunday morning, so that's two weeks from today, but uh, today and next week, wrapping up parables. Uh, It's been a great summer series, and as I've been telling you since week one, a parable, uh, we get the word parable from two words kind of smashed together, first para, meaning to come alongside, the other word balo is to throw. So a parable is one truth thrown alongside another truth. And this is what Jesus did more than 40 times in scripture, but it wasn't a device that was unique to him. This is something that uh, throughout history, you can even uh, find evidence of parables in the Old Testament, but it was a device used by Jesus uh, many times with great effectiveness in, and you could almost hear this collective aha or ah, when, when people finally got it, when the, when the penny dropped, uh, if, you, if you will, when, when people finally uh, had their eyes open to what Jesus was talking. So often he was talking about the kingdom of heaven. He was talking about what his father's like. He was talking about the, the, the idea of, of being a true disciple. And among those things, uh, he kept pushing the issue and, 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 and uh, hitting his point home. And this was a device that he used over and over again. Well, as I mentioned also these last few weeks, these parables are also, uh, I should say, they are always in the context of where Jesus was, and also in the context of his listeners. It was an agrarian culture back then, and so uh, many times he would use references to, to uh, the planting and, the, and the, the sowing that went on, and we're going to be getting into that in just a moment. But I got thinking this week that it would, it, it's kind of interesting, if Jesus was alive today, what would his parables sound like? I, I think in, in some ways they might include cars and commuting. Um, they might include Amazon.com or they might uh, Amazon Prime or Netflix. Uh, hear ye, hear ye, you all have Netflix, right? Yeah, okay, well let me tell you a story about that. You know, it would be in the context of the culture. Um, maybe in North Texas here, it might be talking about ranching. It might tell a story about, uh, uh, um, about uh, raising livestock. He might talk about uh, drilling for oil or gas. Uh, you get the point. Jesus was, was talking about things that were familiar to his listeners. And in this case, it was agriculture. So to take a look at verse 1 of Matthew chapter 13. It says, later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Uh, Chapter 13 goes on with a number of parables after this, but he starts and begins with this one. Listen, he said, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. These seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plants soon wilted under the hot sun and since they didn't have any deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil. And they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears should hear, uh, anyone with ears, sorry, to hear should listen and understand. Have you ever been given some information that you didn't know, that you weren't aware of? You had one of those aha moments? Somebody comes up to you and says, uh, hey, did you know? Maybe for you it was uh, as a kid, you might have been a little older, 16 or 18. You might have been uh, six or eight years old when someone came to you and said, do you know that Santa Claus isn't real? And you went, really? Or maybe you freaked out or whatever your your varying response was. uh, That was new information, Uh, maybe. 
Um, it was funny this week, I'm going to tell a story on Lisa after we celebrated her, but <laughs> it was funny, we were taking pictures of kids on this, on this uh, ropes course, and uh, uh, she was looking at her phone, and she was getting frustrated that her iPhone was, it was dark because the, the sky was light in behind, and, and, and I just said, hey, there's this real cool thing on the iPhone that you, you put your finger on it, and, and you can adjust the brightness before you take a picture, and she goes, Really? It was just like this revelation. And see, that wasn't so bad, was it? But uh, uh, it, it was just revelation. It was a point. It, it's kind of what Jesus was, as he was speaking, as he was teaching, so often there's this new revelation. Well, this was a bang on the same thing. As Jesus is teaching, this idea was profound uh, to the crowd back then. You see, uh, the, the point uh, that he was making was, was that faith uh, and the reception of his message was going to have very responses. And you might not think in our day and age and in our culture, you might not think that that's a profound thing. You might not think, he's like, okay, yeah, um, people come, people go, people receive it, people don't. But back in those days, um, those who were brought up in the religious system, those who were brought up in, in, a, in the, uh, the, the upbringing of faith, it was an automatic thing. It, it wasn't something that was up for question. If someone with, uh, was, was born as, as an Israelite, they, they, that's what they knew. There wasn't this question of whether or not they were going to receive it. So as Jesus starts teaching about this message, about the good news of the kingdom being uh, deposited, and there might be some negative reception or even pushback, Jesus' listeners here on the beach were kind of scratching their head a little bit. The response to this movement, this truth, this faith would be varied. It wasn't a sure thing, and this thing confused those who were listening. It's like they were saying to him, what do you mean this message won't have universal reception? And what Jesus was telling him was this message of hope that you were embracing, this message of redemption that you're promoting will not always have a favorable response. And he even says, case in point, are those religious rulers, those religious leaders that you think would have automatic reception, they're actually out to kill me. And in fact, they will kill me because of this message that I am promoting. And in fact, you guys will have to deal with a lot of that grief as well. And so Jesus goes on to explain this to them. In Luke chapter 8, uh, Jesus begins, and, and Luke accounts uh, by Jesus indicating and giving an explanation that the seed is, is the word of God. It, it, Matthew doesn't make reference to it. It's implied in, in his account of the explanation. But Luke, in, in Luke chapter 8, actually goes into detail and says, and Jesus says that the seed is the word of God or the good news of the kingdom. But in Matthew, starting at verse 18, Jesus explains this parable. He says, now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. It gives an explanation. Now, I grew up in a city, um, concrete jungle, and farming was not something that was uh, familiar to me. I knew I went to the grocery store and I picked some things out and I assumed that they had been grown somewhere. <laughs> Um, it wasn't that bad, but uh, m my primary exposure um, while I was growing up to farming was my grandparents. They owned a, an orchard, uh, about five hour drive from where we lived. Um, and uh, we would go there once a year, and, th and that was pretty much my exposure. Um, a a five-acre plot of uh, apple trees and cherry trees, um, 
pears, peaches, apricots, and that was kind of my exposure until 1999 uh, when Dana and I moved to central Illinois. Now this community that we moved to was a a city of about 80,000 right in the heart of Illinois, right in the central part of Illinois, completely surrounded by corn and soybean fields. And when I say completely surrounded, it, we're talking Illinois is flat, 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 flat. Uh, some say you can watch your dog run away for a week. It's just like, you know, hey, bye, Fido. Um, and it, it's just all corn and And it, it was neat to see uh, living there. It wasn't just visiting and then leaving. It was living there and seeing the, the fields throughout the year. And from season to season, if you've ever had a chance to experience that, you know what I'm talking about, but to see the the farmers get out in the field and start planting. And after a little while, after a number of weeks, you see the, the, the brown of the fields start to green up and as the plants start to grow. And uh, they say uh, about corn, knee high by the 4th of July is good. Now with all the hybrids, it, it, like it's six feet tall by uh, July 4th. But it is forests of, of, of corn fields. And, and then to see the, the fall season come and the, the, the corn uh, drying out in the fields and then the harvesters go in and, and just seeing that the, the rhythm of the, the planting and the growing and the harvesting, really just a stunning thing. A friend of ours, his name is, is Dave, and I was going to show a picture of, of uh, Gabe with Farmer Dave, but um, couldn't quite, just with being away at camp and stuff, couldn't get, get that hooked up. But uh, Gabe used to love going out on the combine with Farmer Dave at the end of the season and, and harvest. And we have pictures of Gabe. And for hours, they'd go up and down the, this field and harvest the grain. It was amazing. It was amazing to see that take place. And amazing to see how the different parts of the field and different parts of, of where the, the seeds had been planted responded how there were some areas that were just amazingly bountiful and other places that not so much. Farmer Dave was the king of technology. He was a John Deere fanatic. And he had like, we're talking GPS steering and, and he, could, he had computer readout in the screen in, his, in the cab of his combine telling him what the yield was as he was harvesting. It was like crazy. But it was amazing to see where different spots and different parts, just looking at a, a piece of, of of uh, a field, you would think, why didn't that produce as much? But, but uh, uh, when it came right down to it, different parts it produced different amounts. And this is what Jesus was getting at. So the four types of the soil, he, he explains, and, and they refer to the four types of responses. The first one was a footpath. And, and if you've ever been to a, a large field like that, a place where they, they, um, they plant some type of grain, you'll see oftentimes these roads around the outside where a lot of the farm implements uh, um, are c- going back and forth. Maybe the farmer's driving his truck uh, around the outside. But there are a lot of these places where it's actually very, very hard ground. It's not good for planting at all. Back in Jesus' day, this would have been where the workers would have circled around the fields or or maybe even there was a path cutting through a field and it wasn't good ground for planting or for growing things. And so the people listening would have known that. This is ground that is hard as rock. It's like concrete. It's hard to penetrate. Seed bounces off and, or it lays on top. And, and, and what Jesus was saying was that was seed that would get snatched away by the birds. And he was referring to the evil one who comes and snatches away the word of God that was supposed to be planted deep and, and producing a fruit, uh, producing a crop. You see, for us, it, it, it's a, an application for us to look at ourselves and look at our own lives. How often do we hear the word of the Lord, but we don't let it sink into our lives? We can have hearts that are hardened. We can have have a a, a negative reception to the the word of the Lord. How often, you know, case in point, Sunday morning. How often do you sit here and and hear the word of the Lord and and leave unchanged, leave unfazed? Uh, It happens to all of us. Trust me, a week with kids will do it to you. If I was sitting where you are, I'd be like out cold right now. No, I'm joking. But but, uh, I understand it's a struggle sometimes to take the word of the Lord and embrace it and allow it to sink deep. 
This is what Jesus was encouraging people to do, was to allow the word of God to sink deep rather than letting it deflect off. Second is a rocky soil, seed that finds a nook and a cranny in a rock, and, but, and it starts to grow, the shallow soil, and yet it, it hits up against the rock and it has no place to grow beyond that. It goes under the high temperatures that burn it to a crisp. And I got thinking about a few weeks back, uh, Dana and I uh, were in Palo Duro Canyon. Uh, we were hiking around, doing some mountain biking. And it's up by Amarillo, a fascinating place if you've never been there. But there a lot of rocks, a lot of just uh, places where things don't grow really well. And you can see where, where seeds have, have, have planted and, and things are starting to grow, but for the most part, they're drying up and they're, they're, they're just crisp and, and they're not producing anything. That's the kind of image I, I get when I think of rocky soil. And for us, it's, it's really what Jesus is addressing is a shallow commitment. Uh, we'll only go so far and then we'll, we'll stop, we'll, we'll pull back. It's like when God speaks to us, are we all in or are we just kind of, okay, well, yeah, let's just try it out, test it out, see how it goes. You know, when we're called to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to be all in. We're, ta- we're called to embrace all that he, he desires of us. I like what Andy Stanley said in, a, in a, a group study that we did about a year, year and a half ago here at Crossroads. He was talking about the term disciple and how a disciple is a follower. And a follower wasn't a, a follower who was going to decide after the fact whether to say yes or no. A disciple is one who says yes even before they know what Jesus is requiring. The answer is always yes. You want me? Yes. You, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Not, hmm, let me see. Let me, let, me, let me figure this out. And this is what Jesus was talking about, the, the seed planted in rocky soil. Third, he goes on to talk about thorns choking out uh, the, the, the seed that's been planted. Out on the west coast of Canada where we grew up, uh, a lot of... Um, Blackberry bushes is what you see in terms of vines choking out other things. Just they grow wild on, on hillsides and, and just choke out all the other uh, plants around. Uh, I, it wasn't until we moved to Texas that I saw really what uh, destructive choking out vines can do. We have those briars and you, you drive out into the country and you, you'll see this huge massive oak tree that's just been swallowed up and destroyed by, by these briars and by these, these vines and it's just choked out. And you get a picture, much like they would have had back in Jesus' day, of these vines coming and choking things out. What Jesus was saying is that people want to embrace the word of God, they want to embrace truth, but yet the worries and the struggles, the fears, all those things cloud our mind and our attention. What did we talk about last week in the story of the rich fool? You know, Jesus was there, Jesus was in this, in this raucous crowd of thousands of people, and he's, he's there, the, the truth, the living word is in their midst, and some dude in the back row says, Jesus, would you tell my brother to share the inheritance? He's freaking out about the equality and of, of the, the family uh, rewards, and, and here's Jesus right in front, and he's so worried about the stuff off to the side. So Jesus goes on to talk about the worries of the rich man, who, who uh, because he was so worried and so anxious about things, made some foolish decisions and completely neglected the, 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 the truth that was standing right in front of him. And this is the, the message of, of the thorns, the, thor- the, the ground where the thorns were. The word of God that's planted within us, that, that just gets swallowed up by the, the worries and concerns of our lives. A um, uh, show of hands, anyone never had a worry in their life? Anyone? There were like 17 in the first service, so they were the holy ones. <laughs> No, uh, but if you've never had a worry in your life, come meet me after the service. Pray for me. Lay your hands on me. Let me like, like walk in your shadow or something. Because there's something going on there that's really cool. But, but you understand. Uh, Jesus himself says you'll have troubles in this world. But it's, you know, what prominent place do they take in our lives? And are they choking out the truth of God's word that's planted in our lives? So the thorny ground. And finally, we hit the good soil. The fourth soil that Jesus talks about is is this good soil. And there's nothing like good soil. 
There's nothing like planting a seed in good soil. You, you get kindergartners put the bean in the, in the little cup with the, the, the soil in it and they water and put it in the window of the kindergarten classroom and it grows. Up in Illinois, those, those corn stalks, I'm told that like, they'll grow eight, 10 feet tall. And I'm told, farmers say that, that uh, they've done some research and as tall as those corn stalks are, the tap root goes that deep. 10 feet down, just grabbing into that good soil. And, and I, I tell you, I've never seen soil like, like central Illinois soil, that upper Midwest. Like, there's no uh, doubt that that's why they plant stuff there and that feeds the rest of the world. It is amazing stuff. And this is what Jesus is talking about. This, this resi- this, these plants that are resilient to drought and to wind, to heat, to the inclement weather. And he says this this healthy, nourished seed will bear much fruit 30, 60, 100 times. And I believe that for us, it's it's a, a, a decision to believe. It's a decision to say, yes, Lord. It's a receptive heart, a soft heart that says, Lord, plant your word deep within me so that I can bear the fruit that you want me to. That's the good soil. You see, there's truth here. There's much to glean. There will always be a variety of responses to the message of the kingdom, to the good news of God's word. And I believe that we're called to check our own hearts. We're called to assess how receptive we are over and over and over again to God's word planted deep within us. I believe we're also, like the disciples, to have a perspective on this world as, as the seed of God's word is planted in, in lives around you, that there will be a number of different responses. Some will embrace it wholeheartedly. Some will embrace and, and struggle. Some will get caught up in the worries of this world, and yet others will still, they'll, they'll, they'll embrace it and they'll grow into full, mature followers of Christ. We saw that even this week at kids camp. Just the variety of responses. Some kids just so excited about their faith. Some kids kind of just, well, not really. Some kids hard as rock. You see it happen. I believe that that's what the Lord wants us to be aware of is that there are those varying responses and there will be those varying responses. But it's also worth noting that there's more to this story. Have you ever noticed that, that this is not called the parable of the soils? You ever notice that? You ever just kind of had that, huh? You know, because when we read the story, that's what we truly get focused on like we have up until this point. We've, we've kind of gone, hey, it's the, the, the parable of the four soils. Yeah, we got the rocky, the thorny. The, the, but do you notice what the title of this parable is called? It's called the parable of the sower. And I think just like every other parable that we've looked at, every other parable that that Jesus touches on, it truly is about the kingdom of God and more so it's about the heart of the Father. This story, this parable is truly about the sower, the heart of God, the attitude of the sower teaching us something today. I believe there are a couple of things of note about the attitude of the sower in this. The first is the generosity, the overabundance. Uh, our front yard, we have uh, a lot of grass. I like grass. I love the grass in my yard. It's, I don't know if it's a kind of a, um, uh, an ode to my upbringing in the West Coast where the lawn is wonderful. Um, as you know, grass is hard to grow here, and we have uh, some brown patches, some brown spots, and this year I bought a huge, massive bag of seed. I did. It's just like this big, the biggest one I could get, the biggest one I could carry, uh, put it in my car, took it home, and I've been planting seed. You know why I have this big, huge, massive bag of seed this year? Is because last year I bought the little itty-bitty bag of seed. Okay? I had this little itty bitty bag of seed and I kind of spread a little bit over this brown patch and I spread a little bit over this brown patch and I spread a little bit more over this brown patch and I spread a little more over this brown patch. And you know what I got when I spread a little bit of seed over a little brown patch? I got a little bit of grass. Right? 
So I, I spread some seed over here. And so this year I was like, no, 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 no. We're not making the same mistake again. I am dumping the seed on that brown patch. Like we are just, you know, if we have an afro over there, we're going to get, you know, come on. We're just going to grow as much grass as we can. And this is the heart of the father. One of generosity. Uh, Paul says in Corinthians, he says, you sow little, you're going to reap little. You sow sparingly, you're going you're to reap sparingly. But if you sow with generosity, you're going to reap with generosity. And this is, the, this is the heart of the Father. This is what Jesus was saying. You know what? He's not going through the field. It's not like Farmer Dave with his uh, technologically advanced John Deere tractor with this, this planter that's like 30 rows wide. And if you live in Illinois, you know what that means. But anyways, it's like 30 rows wide. And he, he doesn't go park it in the middle of this field, grab a little bag of seed and go, one over there and one over there and one over there. He doesn't do that. He packs this thing full. It's got these tanks on the back. He just loads them up with seed and he drives in and he starts planting. And I've, I've been told that 30,000 seeds per acre go into that. 30,000 seeds. It's amazing. Just packs it in. Why? Because he wants a huge harvest. And this is the heart of the Father. He's just. The good news, the good news, the good news, he's just giving it. Farmer Dave's not where, man, if something goes on that, that, that rocky stuff over there, if something goes on to that, that footpath, if some, you know what? Hey, we'll deal with it. We'll, we'll, yeah, we wanted to, but you know what? We're just going to keep, keep going and just keep planting and just the generous heart of the Father. Do you know, Jesus talked about uh, when it hits the good ground 30, 60, 100 times. So get this, 30,000 seeds per acre go into the ground. Care to guess how many come out of that same acre, what the yield is? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll help you out. 22 million seeds come back out of that. 30,000, 22 million. Okay, now here's an exercise for you. I have just given each of you $30,000. Woo! All right? Okay. <clears throat> now, you have $30,000 in your hand. And I tell you, okay, there's a bank up on 51 there. And you take that 30,000 and you take it to the bank and they will give you $22 million. How many of you are going to go, hmm... Hmm. Real money? Like for real, like not, you know. Yeah, you take your 30,000 up to the bank. They will give you $22 million back. I don't believe there's one of us here in this room that would sit there and go, man, I don't know about that. Like that's huge yield. That's Jesus's parable put into our day. Take $30,000, 30 grand up to the bank, you will get $22 million in return. Now we're talking about the spiritual seed, the good news planted deep. That is the exponential yield that God wants to have with his word and his goodness. You understand? For us to grab a hold of the heart of the Father who's generous, who's not sitting there going, oh no, I wonder if it's going to fall on the footpath. Oh no, I wonder if it's going to get choked out. Oh man, just pour it out. Just his goodness. Man, there are, there are some kids at camp where you just kind of look and you go, my. Ah. But what do you do? You just keep pouring out. You just keep planting. Some of you help out in the children's department here, and I'm sure some Sundays you've had one of those pull out your hair moments where it's like, or, or maybe on the other end, it's been one of those, is what I'm doing really making a difference? Let me tell you, yeah, it is. And what it, what's the heart of the Father? You just keep planting. You just keep planting. You just keep giving. You just keep giving. 
So generosity, heart of generosity. The second attitude of the sower, I think is equally as important. And that's motivation. What are the motives? Sometimes I, I believe we miss the point when it comes to giving. Sometimes I believe we give to get. Or we give to see results. Why did I plan? Because I want to see the grass grow. We, we give to see the results, and if we don't see results, somehow we feel like it's time to stop giving. We give to promote something we believe in. How about that one? We give to something that we deem worthwhile. We have a, a, a list, a criteria, and okay, if it meets this criteria, then okay, yeah, that's the green light to give. Can you imagine farmer going into a field and going, hmm. Can you imagine God the Father going, hmm. I'm only going to give my son if. That's not what he said at all. So I believe we need to grab the heart of the Father here when it comes to his motives. You see, Jesus says the Father gives to bless. The Father gives to love for no other reason. He gives because it's his character. It's his character. It's who he is. You know, people get married for a variety of reasons. Sometimes those reasons are what's in it for me. Wonder what I can get out of it. How is this going to benefit me? What's this going to look like? Is it going to have a return on investment that's positive? Whatever the reasons are for getting married, uh, those are probably some of the worst ones. But if you look at a couple that's getting married in a way that I believe is God-honoring is a picture of what God sets before us as marriage is one that we're both individuals are entering in to do nothing other than to give selflessly to the other. Many times I'll stand, my spot's kind of right about here, we put stairs down, the couple comes up, they face each other, we say our vows, or they say their vows, exchange rings, and then I have an opportunity to share with them about marriage and stuff we've already talked about in pre-marriage counseling. But more often than not, my message is a message that was preached at our wedding more than 25 years ago. And it was simply this, love expressed in giving. For God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave. For God so loved the world, he gave. This is the, the parable of the sower. Jesus is standing there in a boat, facing the crowd on the shore, and he's saying, my father came and gave me because he loves you so much. I am the seed, I am the seed. And I know there's gonna be a lot of different responses to me, but I've come to bring life, life to the fullest. And so in that marriage relationship, love expressed in giving. Greater love is no one than this than they lay down their life for their friend. Husband to wife, wife to husband. That's the, the picture of Christ and his church. And so I want us as a congregation to wrap our minds around the heart of the Father again this morning. What has he called you to do? What has he called you to, to live out? How has he called you to grab the biggest bag of seed that you can and just indiscriminately dump it everywhere? Can we do that here in Decatur? Can we do that here in this congregation, in this place? Not, not gauging who's worthy, who's acceptable, how, once again, this is not the parable of the, of, the, of the soil. This is a parable of the sower. Who God is, what is he like, and what did he do to plant the seed within each one of us, and how can we participate in that and plant the seed in so many other people around this community? I'm in, I'm hopefully... You are too. I'm hoping that you are too. Let's pray together.